forward back to my computer. I think you all have to accept to continue. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and, and start our meeting. Uh, I am John Shribs. I'm uh, currently, my, the hat I'm wearing right now is with the General Plan Advisory Committee. And I volunteered to um, join this group of the Open Space and Natural Resources. And I got nominated to be the coordinator and take the lead off on this. So there's myself for that. And I've got uh, lots of things I've done in the past for environment. I think most of you, I think I've know me by now and have seen, and we have lots of friends here. So we all sharing each other. Uh, lots of lots of experience showing up here. So with that, we have um, let the Bill, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself, one of our other team members. Hi. Yeah, I'm Bill Reinhardt, also uh, the GPAC and in the subcommittee and um, a landscape architect and land planner kind of an armchair naturalist and ecology enthusiast, kind of a lover of all things wild and living. Um, and I'm also the official note taker tonight. So forgive me if I don't seem like I'm paying attention, I'm typing. And, and you took a lots of notes last time. So it does a pretty good job of keeping track of that. Okay, right. Janice. Uh, Janice Cater Thompson, member of the GPAC. And, and that's about it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, but, but prior city council member. Prior and city council and, and member. Prior advocate for activist. lots of environmental issues. Yes, a lot of environmental issues. And, so I'm, I, and I purchased a new e-bike and now I'm a biker. And it's, uh, you look at the roads very differently. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, so there's three of us. I think Mary Dooley is the fourth member of our GPAC uh, uh, work group. So, so Mary, if you like just quick introduction. Uh, oh, yeah, just... Um, to add, I'm a, a runner and seeker of watersheds and things that run downhill. I have to <laughs> run uphill sometimes to see them. Um, but by doing that exploration, I feel like I followed almost every uh, little natural creek um, in Petaluma. I, I finally got onto the Denman Reach uh, mm -hmm. just to explore it. Um, last week uh, because I kept driving by it and went, what is this? Um, but it's pretty interesting uh, little project up there with the new trees planted and this flood control. And there's two completely different approaches and one is very natural and one is very like engineering cut and uh, not so pretty, but um, that, and I'm an architect in town and um, love Petaluma. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the agenda for tonight um, is, is pretty simple. Basically, this is a listening session like it was last time for us to, to hear what you guys and what, what people think and, and feel about open space and particularly if they're a part of a special project, nonprofit, have a special mission to kind of give us your statements of, of your idea of what is open space, your participation in the open space, what's important to you, what we need to do, what's the most important for us to do as a city. Um, and then if you can add, if, uh, and then after we have our own personal sayings of what we personally want in our personal missions, um, uh, maybe we could have a little discussion on a couple things too. Two things to discuss after that was what is really open space? And then how can we support each other? What else do you, besides your own personal mission of what you're after here, what do you support in general for, from others and from other groups and, um, and other entities or other I concepts that you say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm really into uh, uh, the North River, but uh, bike paths are also extremely important and whatever. So I'd like to have the um, other ideas presented after that. But, but the first part is gonna be everybody that is a stakeholder. I think everyone here is a stakeholder of some sort for a nonprofit or for some business or uh, personal enterprise. Um, so we'll all get a chance to have uh, five minutes is, the, is what we had last time, and we'll probably set still five, but if you run the six, that'll be okay, but not, not the eight or 10, if we can help it. So we wanna have as many people talk up front and give us our, our, their, their basically their sales pitch as to what they want. And then um, we'll record it all and then uh, have this all posted. And then after that, we'll start opening up for other um, personal viewpoints and uh, opportunity to speak. And we've allowed up to eight o'clock uh, we will close definitely before eight o'clock if we can. 
Um, but we'll have free time for, for discussion back and forth on those two other topics. What is open space and natural resources? And uh, how can we help each other and other concepts we need to in, be inclusive in, in, in what we want to see here in our future in Petaluma? So with that, we have um, several folks here. I think Joan Cooper was the first person to join tonight. So I'll give Joan the first opportunity to, uh, to speak. If you'd like to go ahead and um, tell us what, what's on your mind. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I am one of the founders of Friends of Schollenberger and uh, we were formed back in 2008. Eight, December of 2008, when I was having a drink with David Keller at a party. It was a Christmas and he told me that the county was about to approve an asphalt factory on the banks of the Petaluma River, directly across the river from Schollenberger Park. And I was appalled. I was like, I haven't heard anything about this. What is going on? And he said, well, it's been totally you know, low key, out of the news, and they're just pushing this through. So that began the odyssey of trying to save the river and save Schollenberger Park from the noxious impacts of an industrial operation. Mm -hmm. And what is it now? 2022. So people always say to me, you know, it was an amazing experience where the, the community once informed rose up and said no and you know <clears throat> crammed the city council's um, email boxes and signed 3,000 petitions and <clears throat> uh, we were able to get a strong letter from the city council to the county supervisors when Pam Torliot was the mayor and she said now that we've heard from the voters we have a weapon that we can use and so uh, David also hired an attorney and letter was written and everything ground to a halt for the moment. Um, we ended up trying to um, rally the supervisors to vote, uh, you know, not to certify the EIR after the whole taking of testimony, et cetera. And, and I could go into the reasons why it's not a good place for a asphalt factory, but I think everyone here knows it's not a good place for an asphalt factory. Um, in any case, uh, we lost three to the supervisors approved it. We ended up having to um, sue in superior court. We lost, we appealed, we lost. <laughs> But nevertheless, the um, community of Petaluma, I would say was 80 to 90% against this because across all political spectrums, people understood the value of open space. It's really an open space issue. And it was like my privilege to meet all of these people from young, you know, young people to seniors, uh, the Hispanic community joined in you know, love of open space and the understanding of the value of open space crosses all age, all ec economic levels. And um, well, so we really got to know um, the power of the people to try to protect open space. So um, people always say, well, we lost, right? You know, we lost, we lost, we lost three times. I said, like Bill Cordham told me, Look out there, what do you see? We stood there in Schollenberger Park looking south. I said, I just see, you know, wetland and water. He says, that's right. <laughs> that's because of, you know, the work he did that we don't have big boxes coming up along the east side of um, 101. But I say, just like Bill says, you know, look out there, what do you see? Do you see an asphalt factory? Well, we haven't totally one, but we certainly have delayed this project, you know. Okay, so here we are. <clears throat> Dutra is the name of the company for those who might not know. That is a privately held, you know, very, very wealthy company. They're kind of the bad boys of dredging and they <clears throat> chose the banks of the Petaluma River ostensibly because they wanted to provide the asphalt for the widening of, of 101. 
But in reality, they were kind of running out of um, rock in their quarry in um, McNear area of San Rafael. And they had kind of run out of being able to do whatever they wanted down there. They, there was a grand jury that was convened. They, you know, they no longer could just do whatever they wanted. And I think they were eyeing Sonoma County as a place where they could roll right in and have a lot of um, allies in the construction, you know, engineers union, et cetera. However, they underestimated the people of Petaluma. So I'm so glad to be here, you know, um, as we um, look towards the general plan that will shape what our open space will look like for the next 20 years. And I only hope that, you know, we get the right <clears throat> wording and the right vision into the general plan, um, because at least we'll have that. But having been through this whole saga, I understand that the general plan is only as strong as the elected people who interpret it. It's and really hard for me to have... give you a one minute warning. Okay. It was 30 seconds ago. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, you know, um, the general plan, the county general plan, because this land, these 39 acres are owned, <clears throat> they're in under the county jurisdiction, but um, the general plan, the county general plan clearly stated there shall be no industrial operations approved in the 100 year floodplain. And yet this operation smack in the 100 year floodplain was approved because the elected, the supervisors looked the other way and they decided to take another sentence from the general plan that said, <clears throat> keep the Petaluma River a working river. And since Dutra proposed to bring their aggregate up via tug, the county supervisors were able to rezone these acres and the acres were also protected by the general plan. They were never supposed to be rezoned to a higher industrial use. They could only be rezoned to a lesser use. So and that's so, your, uh, that's time. Okay, so I guess my message is, let's make our general plan as strong as possible, but the real uh, power is in who you elect. Okay, thank, thank you, Joan. The, the uh, next person that, that uh, showed up was, was uh, Lydia. Oh. So uh, if you're ready to go. Yeah, I, I'm gonna read this and a little quickly because I have a lot to say. So I'd like to discuss the West Petaluma Hills near the water towers, an open space of grand, grassland and woodland within our city limits. This green space is connected to a natural freshwater marsh where red-legged frogs live and a bit beyond to Helen Putnam Regional Park. You never have to get into a car. You can walk, hike, or bicycle all the way to Helen Putnam Park and back to town. These green fields include four privately owned parcels totaling 30 acres near the water towers in the West Petaluma Hills. The distance of this beautiful space from town is less than a mile. Due to the prevalent loss of native habitat, Within Petaluma city limits, I'd like to make the case for the wild animals, the native plants and trees that have their homes on these properties and for all the people, the vast majority, not local residents who explore this area. I would venture to say thousands of people enjoy this land each year and have for decades. Most maps indicating open space for Sonoma County show this area as urban space, gray, instead of open space, green. This is deceptive. It is absolutely open space, even though it is zoned R1, low density housing. And the argument for not developing this type of property, one, the much needed accessible green space with a scenic view corridor for passive recreation within city's boundaries. Our city's population will significantly increase in the near future. And keeping this area from development should be a priority. Two, maintaining a natural landscape for community members to continue to enjoy that will con con uh, contribute to their well being and good health. This open space contributes to our ability to have a natural connection, nature connection. Being in a natural space reduces stress, 
It decreases depression as a result of enjoying the green fields, vistas, and wildlife. Three, protection of ephemeral drains, watersheds, native oaks, established native grasses, and groundwater runoff this land provides. These West Petaluma Hills are part of the Petaluma City's watershed to the west as the Sonoma Mountains to the east. Water is now a serious concern and we need to consider the remaining drainages into our valley's groundwater. Four, protecting of existing wildlife and maintaining the existing corridors or connectivity for animals and migrating birds. Five, preservation of a complex ecological system that helps mitigate climate change. Six, the present Petaluma General Plan states, preserve the essential scenic and natural resources of the open ridgelines and hillsides that help define the unique character of Petaluma. This is the last publicly accessible open ridgeline of the city of Petaluma. Its preservation is important. Seven, there are potential wildfires to come and as seen in recent California wildfires, burn structures release significant toxins affecting the air quality for residents and wildlife. Keeping open space free of structures will counter any possible toxin release should a fire occur in the future. The anticipated benefits to native plants and wildlife in this area include protecting the habitats that provide nesting and foraging, providing connectivity via its, its role in a wildlife corridor and preserving the natural landscape. Woodland and grasslands allow for more wildlife biodiversity than most other habitats. A local resident, Vanessa, Dodge, a geologist and soil e ecologist, did a three-year phenology within this area and documented made many native grasses, flowers, and trees. As another local resident and a UC certified California naturalist, I have documented via inaturalist.org numerous native plants, mammals, and birds over a five-year period using surveys and personal documentation on this land. This type of habitat is necessary for the existence of our native bees, which are the main pollinators for existing native flowers and some trees. The grassland provides a source of food for the raptors that feed on deer mice, voles, and gophers, white-tailed kites, red-tailed hawks, northern harriers, turkey vultures, red-shouldered hawks, great horned owls, and barn owls will leave their homes if there is less green field habitat to provide prey. Bobcat, gray fox, and coyote will leave since they too will have less food availability. And they're all there. One more minute. Documented mountain lion has ventured through. And this spring, I documented signs of a dispersing badger passing through the English Hill property, digging and trenching for gophers. But no more if this land is destroyed by building. One can spot or see signs of black-tailed deer, striped skunk, raccoon, jackrabbit, big brown bats, bats, western bluebirds, spotted toey, tree swallows, acorn woodpeckers, northern flickers, American robin quail, and red-winged blackbirds, to name some of the wildlife on this land. Due to development, complex ecological systems are being simplified, losing not only diversity, but also specific species and habitat types. Reduced ecological systems add to the increased evidence of climate change. A greater diversity from land protection from development allows for a vast array of foraging needs and safeguard um, pollinators to predators. With protection and restoration of this complex habitat, both flora and fauna will be preserved and thereby aid in mitigating climate change with their ability to adapt to the rapidly changing conditions. Last bit, the West Petaluma Hills by the water towers with beautiful iconic woodlands and grassland, amazing vistas and an animal corridor should be preserved for the thousands of visits a year from people of Petaluma, Sonoma County and beyond. Nature experience teaches us importance of native habitat. Should we allow another bit of land in our city connected to over 100 acres of open space in Helen Putnam Park to be developed? 
Thank and you. I have to say. Thank you, Lydia. Yes. And uh, if you can, I'd like you to send that to the uh, the four of us, and then okay. we'll we'll put it and include that so that Bill uh, has more your extensive notes uh, because you really put a lot of work into what you just read to us. Thank I've you. I've been studying time. it for a long time here. Yes. Thank you. Can I um, just, can, <clears throat> can I ask? You mentioned the three parcels. Is it is the Cal Water, the Cal Water parcels? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's the largest parcel, and it's uh, almost fourteen acres. Right. And are the other ones privately owned then? Yes. One's the English Hill. Uh -huh. and, uh, that's eight acres. And another one adjacent to it is two acres. I know that the, who the owners are. And another one was just sold on Hayes Lane. That was five acres. Good, thank you. Okay, I see uh, Sierra, have, have, you have your hand up. Is it okay that I ask a question? Yeah. Um, if it, you can say if, no. <laughs> that's a, let's hold off on the questions. Let's hold on to it, and then what yeah. we'll do is, uh, and then uh, when we come back to individual, uh, uh, the, then we can ask questions of everybody after we hear everyone speak first. So I like to have just an open uh, lis listening session first, and then then we'll open it up for discussion and, and ideas exchanging. Sounds good, John. Thanks. Good, thank you. Okay, I think David was the next uh, person that that showed up, so you, you're next in line. All right. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you guys for taking on the, uh, the, the role for the uh, uh, advisory committee, uh, really important. And of course, parks, open space, really important. Uh, as a growing city of 60,000 plus and whatever it's predicted to be in the next 20, 30, 40 years, uh, we're still woefully short on parks. We're woefully short on county parks because it apparently is irrelevant to most of the supervisors that the South County has parks. So we will continue to need to push really hard on the supervisors and hopefully a new supervisor uh, to advance uh, purchases and easements for public access in South County. Um, that includes Lafferty, which is on the way, but it also includes expansion of the parks that are here and new parks. Um, if you look around the Bay Area, uh, Sonoma County, Sonoma Mountain is one of the few areas where there are major gaps in, in uh, ridgetop parks around the entire Bay Area. So we need that, our population needs that within the city under our control, more or less. Um, river parks. Uh, this is a river city, and yet we only have the beginnings of a new river park on the peninsula and virtually nothing upstream in the riparian area. Um, and that is a real loss and it's a real opportunity. Um, certainly the area that um, we've been fighting over, over uh, for, for Dutra, that'd be great as having as a as a park, as Joan and I can explain in more detail, detail later, but certainly the area from uh, uh, the uh, junction of Washington um, Creek to the uh, river and upstream to Corona, if not further, uh, was identified in the open space, uh, Pelham River open space, um, an access plan and uh, we were restricted by the council at that time to only the parcels that were immediately adjacent to the river. And yet the habitat, the enjoyment, the, the areas that need protection and should be eligible for public access expand way beyond that. So instead of being limited to maybe 80 acres or so of land identified in the uh, Petaluma River Access and Enhancement Plan, we should be looking at a couple hundred acres that includes the area that was identified by US Fish and Wildlife as the best Romanian riparian forest along the entire Petaluma River, and that includes the Tribs. And that's the area that is currently subject to, oh, things like Rainier um, and several housing developments that are being proposed, and of course, the developers, what I'll call the developer's wet dream, which is all this flat land that happens to be accessible eventually um, to 101. It's certainly visible from 101. That's the heart of our river city. And I'd really love to see our new general plan really strengthen that those components and start programs for purchasing, acquisition, rezoning, et cetera. 
um, certainly as floodplain. Uh, Flood Factor um, is a website that you need to be looking at if you haven't seen it before, parcel by parcel around the entire country for flood risks, both current and over the next 30 years with climate change. And you can see very clearly there the depths of flooding and the frequency of flooding in our city along the creeks and especially along the river are increasing rapidly. It's no place to build. The Spanish didn't build there. The settlers didn't build there because they knew it flooded. And yet we have council members and uh, the development community that has insisted that that is right for development, whether it's malls or housing, whatever. It's crazy. It's um, irresponsible and it's guaranteed to flood and cause more damages. That is an area that should be taken out of circulation ASAP. While we can still kind of afford that with grants, with other opportunities for funding. Um, likewise, um, floodplain management and never call it flood control because flood control doesn't exist. Every water course will flood. And so it's not control, it's management. And the management that is the best policy is to stay out of it. That's the Army Corps of Engineers policy. After the 1996 Mississippi floods, they said, if you don't have to be there, if it's not water dependent, get out, protect what has to be there and flood proof whatever remains. Um, that should be our policy. And that what that does is gives us the key to really protect a large amount of the city's turf around all water courses. Um, and not just for the convenience of access for the water agencies, machinery or, or crews to cut everything in sight. They've slowly learned how to do that better. Uh, one of my first battles when I moved to town in 87 was Thompson Creek where West Virginia was proposed and at that time, Condiati was proposing to bury the whole thing, and that was fine with the city. We managed to win that battle and have that open space car up Thompson Creek for the benefit of the neighborhood and any residents who wish to be there, uh, and certainly for flood protection. Um, in, and I'll just briefly jump through a couple other things. Neighborhood pocket parks. We built most of the east side. I have to give you your one minute warning. Sorry. Okay, thanks, Mary. <laughs> Sorry. I'll buy you a beer tomorrow. I was taking notes. <laughs> okay. I'm not supposed to. All right. Um, a lot of the east side does not have pocket parks, playgrounds, little places to gather, some shade, street furniture, um, because we believed at that time to build everything wall to wall. And it, it, we need to take some of the some of those uh, areas out of circulation. I wish it was possible at this point legally to undo some of the um, uh, conditions of approval and the homeowner association's requirements for every lot to be occupied by a single family home and be able to to start taking corners both for local retail as well as for pocket parks. Um, so, uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, there's lots more, obviously, I talk about. Um, do put riskfactor.com on your calendar. There are new parcel by parcel map mapping that includes fire risks uh, around the entire country is not up yet. They will have their map posted sometime shortly. Um, but you can actually look at your address and get what happens over the next 30 years, both in okay, terms that's of fire time. risk and flood risk. So thanks very much. Yeah. So thank you, David. And I know you have a wealth of knowledge. You've been at this a long time. So uh, and we what we do welcome is uh, some written statements and as long as you like. But if you can just get it down to succinct points of what we need to really focus in on the most and just make a nice list of ideas, um, then, then we can use that in, in our process of developing and, and making sure that they're all included in the general plan, which is what Great. our goal is to get all these ideas included as possible. Great, thank you, John. What's your timeline? Um, I think we have a couple months right now, uh, but the sooner we get it, the better. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we have a couple months. Uh, nobody's reporting out from the work groups yet, and we're gonna do one or two work groups at a time, and there's five or six work groups. So we have about three months, I think, to, to really start uh, okay. putting it together. And I think folks, because we have such a high um, visibility to the entire GPAC and, and that there is a base map that's being created for 
uh, open space, natural resources, and hazards <coughs> uh, to save what we need to save. That's the most. That's becoming the base map is what's being uh, talked about at, by the consultants. So, um, uh, so David Garcia was, was saying, "Hey, are you guys ready? Are you guys ready to to present?" So they're looking forward for us to be first in line if we can um, in in the presentations back to the GPAC from the work groups. Um, so with your help, the sooner we get written statements and compile things and then be able to come up with a, um, a wish list, basically that's what we're doing, a wish list of this is where we want to go, then, then that will be of benefit. And then we can have the whole GPAC support us in this wish list as the base of all other things. Cool. Thank you, John. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I think the four uh, folks that came in very quickly after that, so if uh, Sierra, Susan, Andy, I assume that's Carol Eber instead of Andy Eber, uh, and Megan, whoever, uh, who would like to go first? If you just unmute and be ready to go. Okay, Sarah was first to unmute. To, yeah, I, I don't have anything to present or to share. Um, I, I spoke last month. Um, I'm just here to listen and, and learn. So if anybody has questions for me, I'm happy to, but I think everybody on this call is familiar with the River Park Project. Yes, and you made um, a presentation last time, so it's so good. It's nothing to add. Uh, you did a good job of presenting your case. Um, and I think everybody is on board with the River Park at this point. Everybody, everything I've heard from everybody is, is we, we want to move forward with that, that project as a centerpiece. So yeah, so you're in a good place right now. Okay, thank you, Sierra. I think Susan's got her hands raised. So Susan, if go ahead and un unmute. Thanks, John. Um, it's good to be with your work group again this evening. I was also in the last meeting and um, took quite a bit of time describing the two organizations I represent and some of the history. So I won't uh, repeat that. And I also sent a pretty lengthy email to your work group this afternoon, coincidentally, with some uh, additional comments about open space in Petaluma and where I see our weaknesses are and where the opportunities are. So I'll appreciate that if your group can read it. I'll just make a few comments uh, by my. Um, it's interesting to be in this group of uh, participants this evening. And um, Joan had mentioned- hey, Susan, if just stop for a second. I think, Janice, there is someone who tried to get in. Please watch for Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Uh, we may have, that looks like possible, uh, I, that's a- I admitted them and admitted so- them, Please be careful with that because that doesn't, uh, we'll find out who that's, who that's from. Okay. Everything, make sure it's legit. Thank you. Do you want to take time to do that? Thank you. All right. Yeah, did you want to take time to no, figure that, that that's out? That's okay, just wanted to make sure. So Janice is working uh, for the participants and watching out for Zoom bombing. So I just like uh, cautioning her about this once she just entered in a minute. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Hey guys, this I is- didn't Sorry, sorry Susan. Button. Okay, please continue, Susan. The, this is Darren Rackus and sorry if the name threw you guys off. That's a, a for some reason I was stuck on my phone, my apologies. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks. <laughs> thank thank oh. you, Darren. Yes. Great, great. Uh, should I continue, John? Yeah, yes, please continue now. Okay, I, I'd only like to offer a couple of expanding and clarifying comments because in my email to your work group this, today, I mentioned um, you know weaknesses within the Petaluma, the city of Petaluma processes regarding um, open space. And um, so Joan had mentioned the Friends of Schollenberger effort, and I'm sure John, you also remember that. Uh, and opposing the Dutra asphalt plant. One of the organizations I represent, Madrone Audubon, was um, very deeply involved in that with the group uh, as a co-plaintiff in the litigation, providing a biological resources opinion and helping to raise thousands of dollars during that effort. So I'd just like to acknowledge the, uh, that the Audubon organization joined at the request of Richard Drury, who was one of the attorneys working for the group. Um, found by David Keller. Uh, David has a really long-standing and wonderful relationship with the Lozo Drury firm, and they are an excellent, excellent firm that, that helps with environmental issues like that. Um, and then the other comment I'd like to make is I was listening to Lydia's um, written comments that she was sharing, and um, you know, it's really interesting because what I didn't hear in that was the term La Cresta Ridge, which is basically the area that Lydia is talking about. 
La Cresta Ridge has a really long history and Petaluma already received one open space grant that the city had to return because uh, the sale was never closed. And then there was a second effort uh, with an application that I actually reviewed at the open space district that I felt very concerned about. It misrepresented the conditions of the property. It misused work of one of my nonprofits and made uh, representations that were just not accurate in the application. And so if that is going to be revisited again, I would like to say that it's really important to have integrity of process and accurate descriptions of of properties that are being considered. La Cresta Ridge is not in the West Hills. It's in the top part of the West Petaluma area, West City area. Uh, but what are in the West Hills are the Paula Lane property and the Kelly Creek property, which is west of Windsor Drive. And those properties are part of the actual wildlife corridor in West Petaluma. Um, whenever I hear anyone say that they have seen a dispersing badger or documented information about that, that raises a big red flag for me because this property, this area of La Cresta Ridge has been misrepresented before for American badger habitat and presence of badger. There was one juvenile badger displaced from the Paula Lane property from destruction caused by the city of Petaluma in June of 2021. And that juvenile badger made its way over to the West Haven area of, um, of Windsor Drive in someone's garden. And that is the only badger, dispersing badger, that was present briefly in that area. And it's really important if we are all going to be participating in these work group discussions, for me anyway, integrity of process is important, honesty is important, and I would like to ask that we all just consider that as we're talking about open space um, in Petaluma. It is a very important uh, conversation to have. Thanks, that's all. Okay, thank you, Susan. Okay, so, um... Uh, Megan or um, Andy Eber, which I think is Carol. Would you like to jump in here and take some time to tell us what your, your ideas are? Megan. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your time and your energy. Um, I appreciate all the work that you're doing and just learning about what's going on. And thank you. Um, we yeah. all have busy lives. So I Good. appreciate that. Megan, before you start, go ahead and tell us. Uh, I know I. Uh, I know who you are because I've met you before, but maybe the others have, do not. So yep. just tell us a little bit about yourself before you start your five minutes. Sure. Um, I'm a wildlife ecologist. I've been working in conservation, wildlife ecology, tracking animals in the old arcane way of following footprints. Um, I also work a lot in outreach and social justice. I'm the lead of the North Bay Bear Collaborative, which is a collaborative of uh, Ag and Open Space, Cal State Parks, CDFW, Regional Parks, a bunch of Pepperwood, ACR, a bunch of non different nonprofits um, throughout the North Bay, including Napa, Lake County, uh, Hopland is now getting in on it. Uh, Marin is now getting in it since we have some dispersing bears into Marin. So uh, that's a collaborative that I'm spending time with. I'm adjunct faculty at Santa Rosa JC. I've been working in habitat connectivity for over 20 years, um, all over California and in um, nationally, and I also work internationally. I really have the great privilege and gift of working with a lot of different tribes and indigenous people. I am working with the Kashaya, the Pomo, um, some Wapo people as far as our county area goes, but um, other tribes as well. So um, John just, asked me to pop in here on like two days ago. So I'm coming in a little bit um, raw and unprepared and informally, but my work is um, open space and habitat connectivity and that kind of work. Um, I think one of the things to me that is so deeply important is keeping space open. I think we can get caught up in lexicon and language of like, is this a corridor, is it not? And really my work has shown me, um, certainly in California and all over the US, 
that keeping space open and having habitat builds diversity. And right now, um, biodiversity is by far the single most important thing to battling climate change. And it's also deeply tied into cultural diversity. Um, and you know, in that, I bring in the cultural diversity because I think it's a good analogy for people to understand that when we have um, more diversity, we have more adaptability and resiliency to deal with whatever change is coming. Because there's a lot of models out there right now that are talking about climate change and this is what's gonna happen and this is what's gonna happen. And depending on who you're choosing to listen to at the time, um, you know, you get a different story. So we really don't know what's coming and we don't know what's happening. We're certainly seeing um, fire act in ways that has never happened in the last, you know, up until about 150 years ago. We're seeing massive storms and patterns changing. Um, but right now, you know, actually uh, Mendocino and Sonoma County are um, in more severe drought than Southern California and Los Angeles because of the ratio of different rains. That is an unexpected consequence. So by having a lot of diversity, which includes having open space, we have more species, um, more uh, trees, more different soils, different kinds of water that allow for adaptation and resiliency to um, respond to what's coming. Because we don't know, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we need to have this one species. Yes, and we don't know, uh, you know, that one species may not be properly adapted to what's coming down the line. So the more that basically we're hedging our bets when we have a lot of diversity going on. Um, and with that, when you have a lot of diversity, you get a lot of cultural diversity, which is including um, different ideas and perspectives. I really believe when you're considering um, your general plan, outreach and education is instrumental to open space. There are a lot of people, you can save open space, you can preserve it, you can say, oh, don't touch it, but it doesn't help to build relationship. And in my work, um, it doesn't do a damn bit of good if we save a piece of land and put it away and people aren't able to touch it. So it's really important that that gets built into whatever general plan you're looking at. Um, open space also is the single most, uh, not, I won't say single, but one of the most important um, mitigators for climate change and increasing heat. Um, it's shown to be cooler, having even open grasslands that may not protect shade for us. The long root systems actually increase um, water penetration, which allows our water tables to rise. I've written a book about salmon in the Russian River and looking at all of those factors. And so um, really what I see right now is water is one of the greatest crises right now. And so having permeable um, substrates and soil systems becomes really important, which open space does have, but not just having open space, but open space that's healthy and touched and tended um, is extremely important. I would say one of the things that has become so startling to me, um, and I've been working on this like 25 years, and it was amazing to watch the bears in the fire. Um, I, you know, I believe in open space and connected habitats, but what we were seeing was in the glass fire, which I think, you know, excuse me, I don't remember all the fires and dates right now, but I think the glass fire was in 2020. Um, we had a mom and three bear cubs, and so she was really identifiable. She actually left that space, um, which was near Angwin, it was Wild Lake Dunn in Napa County, and she ended up about seven miles south of her area while the fire was burning, and then within a month after um, that fire had cooled down, she'd moved back. So she basically had space to move and to travel in the same way we all do. She evacuated and she went back. Um, oh, 30 Kate, seconds, Megan. Great. Kate Lundquist and Brock Dolman and I, we've been talking about like, how do we come up with evacuation plans for our wildlife? And really the answer is open space with that. So you have this reciprocity thing that open space is beneficial for our human needs, but it's also instrumental for keeping biodiversity. And you know, for me, I love all of those non-human species and what they provide. So um, that's just a quick soundbite. I'm really happy to answer questions. Um, yeah. And Megan, what, what's your last name again? Walla, W-A-L-L-A -L -L -A hyphen Murphy, M-U-R-P-H-Y. Thank you. I'll only be able to stay until 7.30. So um, just wanted to let you know that as well. And again, thank you all for the work that you're doing. It's really important. Uh, thank you, Megan, and, and coming in, because I know I, I, she is also one of the teachers for the iNaturalist course for the UC system. 
uh, is where I, where I first met Megan and, and did lots of, um, we went out and she taught me how to track a little bit for a day. Okay, good. Um, so hand up is now uh, Darren. Fantastic. Well, thank you, John. First, I just wanted to mention, um, and I would guess the, the five minute timer has started. Uh, you'll have to ignore my message I left on your phone. The Zoom link on the general plan website was not working. And so um, we were kind of scrambling around and luckily we we're able to, to get the link from Taryn, who's also at this meeting. But just wanted that as a heads up on the, the main general plan page there for uh, open space and natural resource meetings. Um, yeah, so just to introduce myself briefly, my name is Darren Rackison. I've gotten involved in city civic process within the last year, uh, kind of my other side of life outside the day job of accounting and tax preparation. I also host a, an online podcast and kind of a social media presence called Mushroom Hour, hence my name when I joined our Zoom meeting. Um, and it is a, a show all about where I interview experts from really all over the world about ecosystem health and particularly how fungi are so central in ecosystem health. And, you know, I, I think people have said a lot of the important points about open space. You know, I'm really interested in what the implementation methodology looks like. Is this something with zoning where we can prevent certain areas from getting developed? You know, there are obviously protections, uh, environmental protections, things like that. But is there something at a city level where for lack of a better term, can we hard code in? And I know at the most recent priorities meeting, we had brought up a moratorium on development along the river, for example, but that was shot down as not being feasible. So I just want to see if the general plan can incorporate some kind of language to use whatever the feasible municipal toolkit is to, like I said, kind of hard code into the city plan that we will not develop certain areas uh, you know, regardless of potential economic impact, because the ecosystem services provided by the, the ecosystems in question are far more economically valuable than anything you could build on them. And as a point I made in a recent uh, application I made for a city committee is that, you know, as environment continues to change, you know, if Petaluma stands out as having protected these natural resources, it becomes a, an attraction for not only tourism, but for business development, residential, I mean, just for building a, a stronger city into the future and being a more attractive place for people to come, um, having intact, because that's often the dichotomies. Well, we can't protect those natural areas as intensely as you'd like, because then we wouldn't be able to develop. And I think that's kind of a false argument. But um, so aside from that kind of big scale implementation, how do we protect these natural places most effectively that I've lobbied for at city council? I'd also love to see language, including kind of the, the hidden kingdom or queendom, as I, I like to call it, which is fungal organisms. You know, we hear a lot about flora and fauna, uh, our macroscopic organisms that we all know and love, but fungi play a central role to ecosystems and really are a challenge to protect effectively even though they are a keystone element of healthy ecosystem function, they're hard to protect because you can't always see them. You know, when we see a mushroom, that is one ephemeral, almost like an apple on an apple tree that dissolves very quickly, but there is a massive organism under the ground, oftentimes serving a function like decomposing organic matter and recycling it back into the natural system. Connecting with trees. I think a lot of people now understand there's kind of this network of fungi connecting forests. Well, 95% of vascular land plants rely on fungal networks to actually survive. And there's been studies, demonstrative studies showing that forests that have the appropriate mycorrhizal partners and a diversity of mycorrhizal partners grow faster, last longer, more resilient to drought. Uh, and just now we're starting to learn about endophytic fungi, fungi that actually live within plant tissue, within the xylem of trees, within the, the epithelial layer, for lack of, I'm forgetting the term right now, of leaves, and, and actually protect plants against drought. And, and this is a whole new field that, again, is not visible to the naked eye. So I would love to see our general plan as we kind of talk about natural resources in the open space, even just the acknowledgement and language for fungal organisms. Getting used to the triumvirate, flora, fauna, funga, I think is so important to enter that into our discourse because otherwise we're really missing the contributions of such a massive and diverse kingdom of life, depending on estimates. You know, low estimates say there's about 300,000 species of fungi. But when you talk about endophytes, when we talk about 
dark endophytes, things that we don't even understand. You consider that yeasts and different ascomycetes. These are fungi that don't look like mushrooms or even those mycelium root networks that we've all seen. They're fungi that don't look anything like that, that are massively important. Uh, and so the, the high estimates are that there could be as many as five to I've even heard now 30 million different species. So this is a massive area of organisms. There's uh, some great groups in the United States doing work on this front, including access to collaborative biodiversity surveys or what are called fungal diversity surveys using iNaturalist, the platform you just mentioned. Uh, you can do different, what are called myco blitzes, assess fungal diversity in different areas. You know, and that's kind of a project that could implement in Petaluma if we had the vernacular in there, if we started using the word fungi, funga, we started just acknowledging that in every environmental natural resources document. Yes, we understand animals, plants, and fungal organisms. That would open the door to a lot more. Uh, so 30 seconds, Darren. Perfect. Forced research work and then implementation of actual, like I said, diversity surveys, implementation of protections if we have endangered fungal species or if we acknowledge or if we uh, identify key mycorrhizal species something of that nature that are under threat from drought conditions or maybe there may be something we can do but we don't know that until we first get in our language then find where they are and then we can accurately um, make moves to protect it so uh, that's, that, that's my five minute sound bite thank you okay thank you thank you darren and um, since I, I did take soil science classes and even uh, in pest management we talked about things that are in the soil so yeah, so, so as, I, as I tell students who come to, the, to Schollenberger, the mud is alive. And so we have to really study that because that's where birds are feeding. Um, so yes, so we need to include soils and living things in the soils included in our biodiversity and our, uh, what we need to save. So yes, thank you, Darren. Okay, we have uh, Andy Eber who's up next if you'd like to speak. Uh, you are unmuted, so go ahead. Okay, cannot hear Andy Eber, so maybe if, try again. Okay, so uh, while Andy's trying to figure out how to work that out, then um, the next one up, the, uh, we have Taryn who, who just joined us. Uh, so Taryn, we're each getting uh, uh, five minutes to um, kind of uh, say what we like, what our mission is and where we're going and what your vision is and what you'd like to see happen here in Petaluma for open space and natural resources. Um, excuse me, I just want to check in. Is this supposed to be a new, I know, remember Taryn spoke last time, so yes. I, I think uh, we were asking for new input this time, not yes. a repeat of last time. Correct. So, so Taryn, if you've got a, um, uh, I know you're, you're involved in several groups um, and, uh, doing a variety of things. So um, do you have a, something additional to the other, what you said last time? I believe so. Okay, um, we have we do have time, so that's you've got your five minutes. Okay, so um, thank you. Um, I've been thinking for the past month of how to add more value for this group, what more I can offer, and it um, goes beyond my uh, most recent focus of being the old growth forest to being one that's really touches on what uh, Darren just talked about what you can't see, and also touches on what Sue Kirks mentioned about integrity. As in, um, in order to um, get smart and get effective with proceeding to okay, hold secure up, Terry, for a or protect. Hold up for a second, Taryn. Your, your video and your, your um, uh, audio are breaking up a, a bit on our end. So maybe if you take off your video for a second and just talk, that might be make it a little easier to, to hear you. Try again, please. Thank you. Do I sound better now? Yes, you do. Is that better? Yes, Thank it is. you. Okay, so what, what I learned is that, it, um, well, what I'd like to encourage is thinking in terms of a 3D chessboard. When it comes to thinking about and um, plotting out steps to take to protect open space, 
that we kind of develop a scoreboard approach. And I'm sure you guys have covered off on this, but I do want to go through some of my thoughts. Um, um, certainly to score things like biodiversity, wildlife corridor, um, but um, flood risk, flood risk for an immediate sense, and also ancillary or secondary um, sense of whether the river is dredged or not in a certain portion of our river, which impacts flood risk, right? Um, as well as things like um, whether the land is protected as it is, um, what I mean, or, or whether it really needs to be protected. And I'm specifically thinking about privately owned land and um, whether, okay, so one thing I'm thinking about is Cedar Grove. It's privately owned. It's um, got Native American cultural artifacts, artifacts on it, which means that those areas that have the artifacts have to be covered over and not used, right? So not a park, no housing, no road, just cover them up. Now, I've heard that the city is thinking of spending money to acquire that from John Barella, of all people, if you can believe that. Um, but I'm wondering, is that really money well spent? A scorecard that looks at what is the develop, what is the risk of this land, as well as the opportunity of this land? Because as it is now, I'm not so sure that that land is developable, even though developable, even though there are plans to develop it and they want to bridge over it. I wouldn't want to see the city buy land that's not developable anyway. And currently, as a non-developed um, parcel of acres, there are deer there, there's wildlife there, and there are trees there. So does, does it make sense to spend money there? That's the kind of thing I'm thinking should be represented in a chess, um, in a scorecard. Another thing is contextual zoning. We learned with SID Commons that zoning can be overturned and that things um, that happen up in Sacramento, such as Assembly Bill 3194, made all the difference in um, that land being able to have uh, apartment complexes put on it, even though it's wetlands, because two adjoining parcels were arguably um, of a higher zone, right? And so that land was able to be immediately upzoned simply because the city council overturned both the agricultural zoning on that land, but also the land contract, which said that it would never be developed, right? And so that was a city council favor. Things like that, I'm not trying to get into, you know, the nuances of how political favors happen for campaign donors here, but I'm trying to urge us to think in terms of like a 3D chessboard because there's a lot of stuff that gets maneuvered. And unless we see what the chessboard looks like, not just one dimension, but 3D dimensions, we're not gonna understand what it really takes to protect the land. And that's basically all I wanted to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Taryn. Okay, so we have one last person who hasn't, had, uh, hasn't been able to speak, uh, Andy Eber, if you can come back, uh, I see you muted yourself, if you can come back unmute and have some time to tell us what you think. Okay, if not, okay, so in this next phase, uh, just to, to get it kick started, we wanted to talk about supporting each other, supporting ideas that are positive uh, on what we need to do next, what's maybe the highest priorities to start looking at and thinking about what's the definition of open space and natural resources, uh, how far extended, because um, uh, our group, our group of four, um, talked about expanding that concept of what open space is to as large as possible. Um, but one of the things I want to tell you is I just attended the Blue Zone meeting tonight, which is the kickoff meeting, and uh, over 50 people showed up, including many of our council members and, um, uh, and other folks from our government showed in, the city staff, the schools showed up, health district showed up, 
and lots of nonprofits were there uh, being represented um, to join the group. And today, tonight was the kickoff. And tomorrow there's gonna be workshops uh, throughout the whole day over there at the, um, the New Life Christian Church, which is over by the freeway area off of McDowell. So I'd recommend all of us, anybody would like to go over there if you have time or check it out. And what they're talking about the blue zone is um, a changing our whole approach of how we live here and um, our diets, our culture, uh, forming um, uh, relationships with people, a community. And one of the biggest things they said that, that for change tonight, one of the takeaways related to this group is daily light exercise at where you actually exercise and actually meet folks also at the same time, whether walking on paths or walking down the streets, uh, walking in our uh, whatever forest we have available to us. Um, but that just walking or biking was really important and that our open spaces and, and, and also are sharing our experiences with each other. So there's a lot going on there. And then the cool cities uh, have had meetings recently that I just got trained. And that is referring to another transition of, of climate change actions, which all tie in, which all ties in with the work that we're doing here in open space and natural resources. We're in a time, I believe, in transition, and, and I'm really looking forward to what we're doing right now at, at all levels, all the way from county to city to uh, nonprofits to personal, um, and, and it's coming to a head here, and, and this is our opportunity. So I love having you here, and so what I'd like to do is go ahead and um, tell us what you um, think, if you have questions for the other speakers, or if you have um ideas to share as to supporting others, that would be great. So uh, first hand up, I see Darren has raised his hand. So I guess I'll let you go first. Uh, sure, a couple items. First of all, I wasn't familiar with the Blue Zone program. I've heard the name, uh, but I wasn't sure what the program was. So if you can give us a little, you know, 10,000 foot view on that, I, I would really appreciate it because we may um, get over there tomorrow. And then yeah. uh, I also, my ears peaked up at Karen talking about, you know, zoning being overturned. And this is a really a, a germane thing to talk about because we have seen, you know, attempts at protecting natural spaces be subverted. And maybe, you know, in my case, due to some ignorance and, you know, what are the most effective protections? Is, is zoning even going to be effective? Can development kind of override even the most you know, protected forests is a great example down in, in Ecuador, where it seemed like they had these kind of heritage forests they protected, and the government was able to play name games and kind of get those areas developed. So do, do you know, if anyone here has a firm grasp, and I, 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 people I'm hearing talking are, you know, incredibly experienced and knowledgeable, do we have a firm grasp on what the tools are that we can use to stave off development in open spaces, uh, even within the or within the urban growth boundaries, so. It, okay, Darren, uh, two questions. I can answer the first one about the blue zone. Uh, at the highest level, it is through the healthcare district is, is sponsoring this and uh, on this project, and it's gonna be a huge effort here over three to five years. We've, we've been selected with by blue zone to be the next city in line. And the basic outcome is longer life. And they went to demonstrate several cities that they've done research with over the last 20, 30 years. And um, certain cities in the world have a longer lifespan for both males and or females. And they showed us a couple examples. And their goal was after the research is what is what works to make these longer lives happen in these cities. Um, and so it's all about creating a healthier community that creates an environment, a healthy environment that gives us all longer, healthier, happier lives. So they're, um, and they've been able to demonstrate that when they participate in a city and make these things happen, including diet and um, exercise and community and relationships um, with people and with the outdoors, that when you put that all packaged together, um, people can live an average of 10 years longer because that's what's happening in these cities. They're living 10 years longer than other cities that are similar, but have that different lifestyles. And they're promoting, and they've looked at this lifestyle for um, how to advance it. And so this is where we come in and our open spaces and forest bathing all is going to be part of that. So that, that's the, the high level zone of what Blue Zone is all about, what I could gather tonight. Hey, Thank John, you. Let them know too, the, uh, the Blue Zone's website 
um, the local chapter has a great, they've got a, a listing and all their um, events going on tomorrow are all kind of listed and described. And um, they, they give you a pretty good in-depth, you know, uh, description of their mission and, um, and what it means. Yeah, um, but, but Penlist is just, apparently we, we've signed the contract and we're gonna be working with them over the next several years to make it happen here. It, John, okay, going back to the second question that he had was about zoning. And I, I take a stab at that, John, bit, you got that covered. Okay, well, well I'm gonna uh, probably pass it to one of the other experts here who know a little bit more about this, but my personal knowledge is uh, we were able to rezone the peninsula and, and change it from a, a um, privately owned land that was cattle that they wanted to develop. We turned it, zoned it back into a park and we kind of forced the issue on that one. So there is some possibilities and I know zoning has been done in other cities to change things around and eminent domain is, is available. Um, but that's all, but there's politics and legal involved and zoning is very important. But I think David, I think you've had the most experience of what I know from your past of, of dealing with politics and zoning. Um, would you care to, to, to chime in on that? Um, okay, I'll take that in my lap. <laughs> it's um, the general plan is extremely important. That is our, the cities, as a charter city, that is our Bible of land use development and land use. Um, and use of the word shall, where you want to change zoning, is critical. If you say may or would or should, it's not mandatory. Shall is the only language that is mandatory. Um, anything else? Uh, is up to the council or planning department or where it's by right, um, where you can avoid the general plan completely. Thanks to increasing moves by the legislature, um, you're taken out of the picture completely. So on stuff you wanna get to and the goals, um, policies, priorities and programs as a, as a uh, structure of the general plan, um, you've gotta be adamant about what you want. If you don't do it, it's just there for the tinkering with and somebody will mess with it. If it is shall, then the council as the final decision-making body has to do a resolution to change the general plan and that's a public vote, public hearing and so forth. Anything else can be undone um, at a motion, at a resolution um, or again by staff or as a by right um, administrative decision. So in, in when you think about the language you, you're proposing to the general plan committee and for the general plan, you need to be really clear about that. Um, good, thank you, David. That, that's a good summary, we'll, yeah. we'll, we can follow that up. So I asked you to, to respond and help out, but you had your hand raised before that. So did you have something else on your mind you wanted to share? Yeah, with? Um, quickly, in, in the shall department, shall get rid of Rainier. Rainier does so much destruction to things that you were talking about. Aside from um, screwing with traffic, it doesn't do anything in the long term for traffic congestion. Um, that's been demonstrated through uh, a, the failure of any engineer on either of the two EIRs to say how much time would be saved on Washington crosstown traffic if Rainier was built. And the flip side, which is how much additional congestion would be engendered um, by the construction and development necessary to help pay for Rainier. Um, there are council members who still love that. There's a whole community out there of builders and chamber of commerce types who want it to happen because it's been around and there are a lot of people who've made a lot of money. But that uh, divides the corridor, the river corridor that we're trying to keep intact as a corridor. It divides it completely. It destroys the integrity of it, <clears throat> which has already been damaged by the outlet mall and by the current Sid Commons proposal. Um, and it really starts to fracture any ability to save the pieces in the long run, because after it's broken up, people can say, well, what good is it? Or we'll put a trail along the river and everything else can be developed. You're losing wetlands, you're losing vernal pools, you're losing riparian forest, you're losing all the undergrowth, you're losing um, the, the ancient 
grassy wetlands. If you look at the San Francisco Estuary Institute uh, report on um, Petaluma Valley, please do. Uh, it has a lot of history on how did we get to where we are, uh, why we have flooding the way we do. Um, the east, all of the east side creeks never connected as a bed and bank to the river. They all flowed over land. Why were they put into their beds? Because that way you could develop up to the bank or beyond. Um, and yeah, none of that. Let's, let's, could you, uh, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. I'll just say that. Seconds? Yeah. I'll, you know, Final words. Pretty, um, it destroys any ability to manage flooding in Petaluma, and it destroys um, a, a key portion of what makes this a river town, uh, and it's done forever. Um, so please change the general plan so that that is not an option. Thanks. Good. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, looking at the time, we have 15 minutes left, and we have four hands raised. So if we can keep it to two minutes or less at this point, and I think going into what the hands raised, I saw in order was Susan. Mary, uh, Janice, and then Darren. So we'll go through all of those four in order um, and try to stick to, to two minutes if you can. So Susan, you're first up. Thanks, John. Um, I'm, I think I just wanted to um, ask that probably in every conversation we have, and as we speak about Petaluma specific things, and of course we're relating to the general plan, to keep in mind a bigger picture of the Petaluma Valley and how the Petaluma Valley uh, fits into the North Bay area. Uh, what is our relationship to the borders, the borders of Marin County to uh, north of us? to west of us, over to Pengrove, Katadi, uh, north and west to Sebastopol. And as we look at maps, which I'm assuming we'll do in terms of identifying uh, existing open spaces, green spaces, and how we can um, potentially identify areas for uh, connectivity for wildlife and um, deserving properties that are remaining that can be saved, uh, it's just a really good idea to just keep in mind how Petaluma fits into the area where we live. So we'll be looking at details, I understand, but how we relate to um, the other areas will also, I think, help us expand awareness and help us understand um, how and why we can connect into that bigger area. Uh, and the wildlife corridor mapping that I had mentioned before, it, it does lift that up and really reveals that Petaluma geographically is, uh, is an important area for wildlife movement in a variety of different connecting parts. Um, so thanks, that's, that's my comment. Okay, thank you, Susan. Okay, uh, next up I think was, um, I think that was Mary. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I wanted to mention that um, uh, as far as dredging goes, we, we haven't talked a lot about the river specifically as open space. We've talked about um, the Corona Reach and the importance of um, preventing uh, Rainier and 100% um, on board with how we do that have been from the uh, uh, start of, of this general plan. Um, committee, but um, we need to dredge under the turning basin. Um, it, it was dredged, uh, you know, after many years, we finally got a portion of it dredged, but um, it's, it's speaking of the heart of our, of our built town, it is open space that's uh, not getting any attention and there's a, a lot of, of recreation that can happen from that that point, they've been trying to open the float house for years. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to raise. I'm, I'm really uh, behind what uh, Megan was bringing up today about the diversify. I kept thinking of diversify your portfolio um, that, you know, hedge your bets. Biodiversity is the key and, and water is the most important. And she had a lot of really important uh, points for us to bring. I don't think everybody needs to be a, um, 
biology expert or a wildlife expert to put together the kind of structure that we're looking for from for, for the general plan. I mean, our job is to listen to what the, the public input is and then try to coalesce it and, um, and find our common ground. But um, part of our, our role here is to kind of take that as a vision um, to, to go forward with. So I think lastly, in my two minutes, um, yes, we know about shall. <laughs> David, we've been, we've been dealing with that a lot. Um, I loved your flood, flood management, not control. Uh, that was really helpful. Um, and my vision is to actually find a way to connect Denman Reach all the way down to Ellis Creek and um, some mapping. I've been doing some mapping and how to, how to make that a, a connected public way would, would really make the river the centerpiece of our town for everyone to understand and connect with. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, Janice, you're up next. Um, actually, a lot of what Mary said is what I have in my notes. I was really intrigued um, listening to Megan and just, um, you know, about the diversity and a lot of the other comments. But I just want to bring up as far as, um, you know, Mary, you had once we were talking and you said, oh, a thousand feet back. It is not an unreasonable after listening um, that a thousand feet is not unreasonable from the river. And this is the last corridor that we have. And once that's gone, it's gone. And um, we're just lucky. I mean, David and I have been working on this area for, you know, since the 1990s and, and it's still not built up. And so we have actually a lot of opportunity. I was gonna talk about the shall also. Yes, David, we brought that up early on about language really does matter. Um, but I wanna talk quickly about the, um, the slaughterhouse, the property where um, the um, Anderson Brothers gun shop is. That's a historic gun shop there and that building. And that building is high. And I really feel like there must have been Indian relics there or there, there has to be in that area. Because if you've ever walked it, it's, and you look at the proximity to the river, it, it just makes sense that that was an area where Indians would have lived. And I think that really needs to be explored um, within this general plan. And we have not been able to get that done over the years. But from what I'm hearing from everybody, um, this, this area is extremely important and we really do need to preserve it. And we, we should not be playing around with numbers. Um, we need to really go for the highest maximum distance from the river and protect this. And then we're talking about the blue zone. It all ties together. And then we're talking about the habitat corridor. You know, I mean, I always, I, I'll talk about the Deer Creek Shopping Center and that creek. I really urge everybody just to go over and walk on those bridges and see what um, plants are there, native plants that have been buried for years and they are just coming up naturally. That whole area, that's what the entire area looked like. And David's correct. I mean, they went ahead and built these, um, you know, areas so water would, would be able to flow because the land was just flat. That's where I was raised. We didn't see any of these creeks, but that water, you just saw all the, all the ripples in the, in the um, topography and you knew where they were. And now, you're seeing actually um, the plants re, um, regrouping in these areas that have been native for a long time. And you can really imagine what it looks like. And so Mary, I go back to your thousand feet. Deer Creek is way past a thousand feet and it is restoring itself. And then I think of bears, you know, moving from one area to another. Animals do know what to do. And then they do come back. And I, I look at this corridor as so important. And once that corridor is gone, it's really, um, it's detrimental to the habitat, animals, everybody. So um, I just really appreciated everything that everybody contributed tonight. But I would like to reconnect with Megan and have more of a conversation. John, maybe you could reconnect her with me. Um, with Megan, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, that would okay. be great. Then we I have Darren and then Joan. Huh? So we have Darren next and then Joan. Oh, great. I'll, I'll just keep my comments brief. I just wanted to follow up on Rainier. I was at the May 9th budget workshop 
And, you know, there it was looming. They had pushed it all the way back to fiscal year 27, 28, but they had Rainier on the list of budget CIP projects, $70 million earmarked for fiscal year 27, 28. Uh, so, yeah, I would love to see some kind of implementation just kill that thing. I mean, they're kicking it down the road, trying to, but we just need to to get rid of it. Um, and then I also just wanted to point out, I mean, I love this discussion, the, the shale, the, excuse me, shall feels like a massive piece of the puzzle for me for understanding how do we get the definitive protection. So thank you guys for for bringing that to my attention. And I just want to put out there as well that I, I have put my name in the uh, consideration for planning commission. Um, you know, I said I was a tax prep and accountant. I'm also work as a project manager for an environmental consulting firm. I have a pretty good idea of the, or a pretty good understanding of the development process and would love to bring some of these issues, not only the general plan, which is kind of the core, the foundation, but would like to have these issues, these viewpoints find a voice with that commission as well. Um, so, I, you know, if anyone has advice in that arena or any kind of show of support with letters to the city, uh, I'd be eternally grateful because like I said, I would love to give, give a voice to these issues on that commission. Thank you. Good. And one of your earlier comments, Darren, was uh, um, about the moratorium on the um, on the land around the river. Uh, and it wasn't that they were negated it, but what happened? The staff said, "Oh, it, it's going to be up. Uh, let's let the general plan take take that, and not have it as a city goal for the right. two year period, but to actually make it a twenty year goal and extend it out and make it more powerful by going through the general plan." And they're kind of looking at this committee to kind of push that forward throughout. So I, I think that the city didn't deny it as much as um, let's let's use this process to, to support it. And just, just as a comment from what you said earlier. Okay, so next up is, is Joan. And if uh, Janice, if, if you have your hand up still after that, we'll let you speak again. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll be Joan. Okay, um, I, uh, what Mary Dooley said really resonated with me where she said, you know, in terms of big picture open space, let's the river is the centerpiece of the town and the river has the upper river and it has the lower river and the river has two sides. So it's a wonderful idea to be thinking of going, you know, preserving open space all the way down through Ellis Creek. But remember, you have to look on the other side and it, the other side is 39 acres. Well, there's several other acres, but one parcel is Dutra's 39 acres. It's privately held, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't um, make a bid to turn that into public open space. And so I would like to see the general plan take a look at the southern entrance, the gateway to Sonoma County and the gateway to our city. And instead of um, allowing it to be degraded, by an asphalt factory that uh, we should focus on that in the general plan and say this should be a gateway and this land should be restored. A lot of money has already been spent restoring the wetlands in that area, opening up the dikes that were degrading and we are reclaiming the river and cleaning up the river and that direction and that investment should be continued. So I'd like to see the general plan focus on the whole river on both sides of the river and identify these privately held lands as potential park lands. Um, you know, the connection between open space and health and longer life is real. If you preserve and protect Ellis Creek and Schollenberger on one side, and on the other side, allow a polluting, extremely unhealthy factory to operate, and they operate for 25 years or more. You know, with you know uh, the impact on heart attack, stroke, cancer can be measured with um, air pollution, and what happens when there is uh, an event like a misfunction of a factory where the computer then tells you, oh, sorry, we emitted X, Y, and Z, and therefore, you know, you can then track increased heart attacks, et cetera, when these things happen. So that's um, my pitch is to take, uh, you know, in the general plan, in looking at where are opportunities 
for open space, public park, public access to open space. Don't overlook these lands that happen to be in private hands, but could become part of the public commons. Okay, thank you, Joan. Um, and just to add to what you've just said, uh, not only those lands immediately south of the city, but the entire Petaluma Marsh I know is under um, risk for sea level rise over the next 50, 100, 150 years, especially the longer term, because folks said instead of three feet, it's actually going to be more like 10 plus feet over a 200 year, 150 to a 200 year period, unstoppable. So there's that. And I know that the RCD is working on ideas and plans, as well as Sonoma Land Trust and working with the growers down there to change uh, various properties and diking systems that they're planning and working on down there. Um, so we need to also get the city in, engaged and involved in the entire uh, marshlands all the way down to the bay and be joining in with the bay regional uh, organizations that, are, that have formed to look at uh, saving the entire bay as well and that we get need to be included in saving the bay. We're, we're part of that. We're not, we're not separate from the bay. We are part of the bay. So uh, we need to make sure that the city is, engages and make sure our um, leaders engage with the uh, the Bay Area leaders to, so that we are part of the entire Bay. So yeah, so we wanna support all of that. I think last up, I think Janice, you still have your hand up. Any last words here? Um, it was basically what you just said, John, that you know we have to go all the way down to the Bay. I mean, it's not, it doesn't stop at the Schollenberger or the wastewater plant. Right. We, Those are our water, we have to look at the entire watershed. Exactly. All north, exactly. All the way down south. And from the city yeah. plan, even though the general plan is for the city, we need to make sure that the concepts for the entire watershed are inclusive uh, within and that we need to be cooperative and in coordination and supporting all of those other efforts and be included, make sure we're included in all those other efforts and not left out by open space and, and ag lands and, and left out of coastal commission. We need to be seeking out all these partnerships. Right. We, do, we just don't want to segment anything, but I do want to say something um, when you were talking about Rainier and the 70 million, I do believe that Corona might be on the CIP list for the first time. And I will check that. Um, capital CIP? The capital improvement projects. Yes. And I so know. I think it might be on that list. And so I think it's really important that we look and shift that money. So Rainier is gone and we actually um, can achieve what we want to achieve. Excellent. Okay, thank you. It is now eight o'clock. Is there, uh, from our four member committee, is there any other final words? Just thank you so much for everybody who yeah. shared their knowledge and yeah. input. It's really yeah. great. Oh, great input. Thank you, everybody. I've got some good notes, got some great new ideas. Really appreciate the sort of bioregional context of the whole discussion. I also would encourage people to think, you know, we've had a lot of great discussion about, uh, you know, larger open spaces and corridors and um, like to, say, to be thinking about how we can, you know, even incorporate these principles into the urban, it, the, the, the developed parts of the city, you know, we're still a city of people as well as animals and wildlife and, um, and as uh, you know, I fully support everything that's being said, but I'd also like to see how you know, we can extend these corridors and the open space and the urban forest and everything all the way into, you know, into downtown and wherever. And I think part of what the general plan effort will be is to craft the policies, you know, that, that allow that to continue. And you can see streets like the road diet, South Petaluma Boulevard being constructed with contiguous curb gutter and sidewalk. And all of our street standards, our engineering standards have street trees as the standard, yet the road's not being built that way. And that goes back to, you know, David's and the other discussion about shall versus should or may. And, um, you know, it all comes down to who's making the decision and who's who's arguing, you know, who's fighting for what's right. And um, so we'll set, we'll do our best to set the policy, but, you know, we're, we're all going to have to, you know, it's not going to end there. But anyway, thanks everybody. <laughs> Great discussion. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for coming tonight. And, um, and then we're going to meet and talk about what where our next steps are going to be at uh, we'll have, our work group is going to meet and talk again and see what we're going to do over the next two or three months where we're going to go from there so i'll meet the the work group will meet i guess next week to have that discussion and then we'll find out uh and then we'll be able to announce what next steps will be okay Great. thank you for your time tonight thank, thank you, you. Thank for you thanks bye-bye bye-bye